uh, hang out uh, before this before this event, and uh, to continue our conversation, uh, there has been a history of of hot headed accordionists. Uh, one of the most hot headed accordionists was actually Guido Darrow, Pietro Darrow's brother. Um, for a while, they were at odds with each other. Uh, apparently, they made up at the very end. But apparently, if he didn't like a performance, uh, he would like smash his accordion against the wall. And, uh, and he, must have had, he must have made a lot of money because he had to buy a lot of accordions or knew a good repair person. And apparently, Guido was married very, very briefly to Mae West. And uh, she even puts in her bio that she was married to a hot-headed uh, accordionist. Uh, and uh, Pietro Dero Jr., uh, no longer with us, used to attend the seminars. We even had a special seat for him every, every year. And so, uh, so I, I said to him, I said, uh, and he, he confessed that uh, he was, uh, when he, he remembers being cradled by Mae West. And then I said, did your uncle Guido really, really smash accordions against the wall? And he said, yes, I've, I witnessed it. Uh, and he really did do that. Um, another uh, hot-headed accordionist uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we had back at our conservatory, New Power Conservatory, where, uh, uh, where I attended, uh, uh, we had a gentleman, uh, Nicky Wayne. He was a, a wonderful jazz accordionist. And uh, at one of our concerts, uh, he played with a guest artist, Matt Matthews, one of the great Dutch button accordion players. And they did duos, and it was an incredible concert. Uh, and what happened is encore time came along. All of a sudden, there was time for encores. And of course, someone in the audience yells out, play a polka. And... Uh, of course, Nicky Wayne's name was Nick Budkovich. And, uh, and all of a sudden, Matt Matthews, one of his friends, comes up from the audience who was a polka player. And Nicky Wayne, of course, Nick Budkovich, had to leave the stage. He didn't want to be, he didn't want to play a polka. So Matt Matthews all of a sudden starts going into a polka, the Dutch jazz player, along with his friend. Um, they, they play Jan's, uh, Jan's Polka. It's in one of, his, one of his albums. And you could hear the sound of someone punching the wall backstage. And you could tell that uh, the fist almost went through the wall. And apparently, uh, that was another hot-headed example that I, uh, that I, uh, that I actually saw firsthand. Um, and also, uh, one of the things that accordionists have to look out for when they go into professional situations is not to get hot-headed if you're challenged. You know, if the conductor starts giving you a hard time, you really have to be cool. And uh, never go up to a conductor and say, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, there's been a few accordionists who have done that and uh, you will be out on the street uh, immediately. So temper that hot-headedness if in any case you have it. Uh, we also uh, talked yesterday about good, uh, good posture. And I wanted to elaborate on that because I mean, there's all kinds of methods today on how to get great posture. There's all kinds of techniques and the seminars really never endorses any particular one. Uh, that's not what we're about. But I can tell one experience that I had with my first grade nun, uh, which is in the early 1950s, Sister Angelica. And uh, what would happen is we would have to recite a rhyme every morning when we sat down. We'd have to say hands on desk, feet on floor, body on desk from back to floor. If for health and strength you care, that's the way to take a chair. And uh, we first of all, we'd open up with a prayer. Then of course, we'd do the Pledge of Allegiance. Then we'd have to sit down and recite that rhyme. 
which meant that we had to really sit straight on our desk chairs with our hands on it. And I felt that it was really, really a good, uh, it was good advice for accordionists uh, to sit up straight and sit in a, in, you know, not, not stiff, but straight and sit in the middle in a comfortable position and be able to move freely. I'm doing a little interpretation of what Sister Angelica was saying, but nonetheless, it always stayed with me. Now, this was, a, even when I was going to school in 1951, I think it was when this happened, it was already beginning to be a rough neighborhood. We had some really, really bad kids in class. And so when she said, that's the way to take a chair, I never quite knew what chair she might be training them for. Uh, and uh, we hope that, you know, we hope that it wasn't a chair with wires on it. And so, <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, uh, that's, uh, that always stayed with me. So a word to all of you is to establish, to establish good posture, it will give you, it will give you longevity. And uh, now, I'm going to introduce, a, he's already become a legend, especially this year. His fame has soared internationally uh, because he got this idea during this particular situation we're in. Why not go out on his front steps and play uh, in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, on the steps of his house? Why not st step out and play for all the people passing and, uh, and hanging around. And what happened is it went viral all over the, uh, uh, first of all, it went viral locally. Then all of a sudden it went viral over uh, nationwide and eventually viral all over the world. And, it, and some of the news clips showed uh, like some of the hippest people in Brooklyn all like doing the hokey pokey six feet apart. Uh, <laughs> Or, you know, things, you know, the alley cats all together, but, you know, six feet apart. And on actually absolutely having a good time. And, and Paul Stein was up there entertaining on his front stoop. And just giving them a little more pleasure than they would normally have, you know, confined in their uh, individual spaces. But it'd be better, it'd be better if Paul Stein told you about this, and he's going to. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to... Paul Stein. Everyone, this is Paul Stein coming to you, to you from my living room instead of from the Tenry Gall Gallery where we usually do these workshops. I'm happy to be back for another year. And I'm sorry that Bill can't be with, here, with me here because we were, were a good team working together on workshops. I'm very happy that I let my partner, Elena Schwalski, has agreed to, to fill in as my partner in this workshop. And she has a few questions for me. The title of the workshop is Conscious from the Stoop, because as some of you may know or may have seen, I've been doing Conscious from the Stoop. And you should already have seen, as part of this uh, intro to the workshop, a press uh, video that, that went all over the world from the Associated Press featuring the concerts from the stoop. Elena? So Paul, when did you start doing concerts from the stoop? Well, I started doing concerts from the stoop shortly after the pandemic lockdown in, in New York City. Um, Elena and I live in Brooklyn. We're very fortunate that we live in a townhouse that has a stoop. And even before the series of concerts from the stoop began, I had on occasion taken my accordion out on the stoop and played for the neighbors and gotten a good reaction from them. So why? What gave you the idea to start doing this during the lockdown? Well, I had seen press reports, on, mostly on, on television, of uh, people in Italy and people in France singing from this stoop, clapping from this stoop, playing musical instruments. Uh, supporting supporting the essential and healthcare workers, and just lifting their own spirits by 
without breaking their own personal quarantines, uh, leaning out their windows, going on balconies, uh, going on their roofs, and making music uh, together. And it sounded like, like we could do this here. But we live in, in Brooklyn, New York, and in Brooklyn we do have windows. <laughs> we do have occasionally a balcony in a building. But we have stoops. Brooklyn is known for stoops, and it's a very Brooklyn thing to do, just hanging out on the stoop, chatting with your neighbors who are a stoop away. And the stoops are, are separated by much more than six feet. So it's, it's very easy to talk to someone without getting too close to them, even without a mask on. And what kind of reactions have you gotten from neighbors and others? Well, it's been amazing that the reaction I, I've gotten. I mean, I, I started out, first of all, my only intention was to do this for the neighbors on our block in Sunset Park in Brooklyn, which is a, a very nice residential block. And um, I used a small amplifier because there's natural amplification from the houses on either side of the street, on this relatively narrow street. And uh, the idea was to play songs that they were familiar with, that were mostly up-tempo, and that would, would lift people's spirits. I mean, I did everything from the Beer Barrel Polka to Que Bonita Bandera, which is a, a song of, of Puerto Rican uh, pride and uh, celebration with a number of our neighbors of Puerto Rican. I did some klezmer Jewish Jewish music. We have Jewish neighbors. I did some Italian, some a little, a little of everything. But basically, again, songs that many people would know, because from my experience, having played for literally tens of thousands of people at Thanksgiving and Christmas community dinners and elsewhere, uh, people enjoy the most. Uh, it, uh, it lifts their spirits the most, I think, if they if they hear things that they're familiar with and that they can sort of hum along to themselves or sing along to themselves with. So that's what I did. And the reaction was amazing. I mean, people would scream across the, the way thanking me and people were, were singing along, people were, were clapping their hands, people were, some got up and danced even, some just sat on their stoops and moved around to the music. and. Uh, it was very clear that, that they were excited to have music and it was very clear to me that it was certainly lifting my spirits because I, like everybody else, I've been very concerned about the, this terrible pandemic and the, the mismanagement of it by, by the government and the uh, federal administration and others. And um, it, it just made me feel good to be able to play for other people and um, you're, most of you in this audience, I'm sure, are musicians, and you understand perfectly that you're much happier playing for a live audience than playing for uh, a, a webcam or, or a TV cam without an audience, because there's a connection that you see instantly between you and the audience. So I got a, got a great reaction from the neighbors. In fact, I had to discourage people who didn't live on this block on either side of me, and it, it, it made me feel bad, but I, on a few occasions I had to discourage uh, friends from coming and gathering in front of our house because I thought that that would lead to a situation where there wouldn't be proper social distancing and it would be adding risk to a situation where our whole goal in, in playing from the stoop and not doing live you know, concerts and venues is to, is to social distance and not put people at risk. So now that you've been doing it for a while, how, how do you feel about it? Well, I feel great about it. it, it it's become an institution <laughs> to me and, and on my block here. Every week, I would say just about every week, I've done a concert anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour, an hour and a half. And um, Sometimes there are a number of people out and sometimes they're not. And I've, I've linked up the concerts. The other thing that's going on, which many of you in New York and other places may be familiar with, is back from the middle of March when I started this, 
people have been hanging out their windows and in front of their their buildings and on their stoops cheering on and thanking the essential workers and the health care workers and uh, I do that every night I don't think I've missed one night since the middle of middle of March and I comp along on the accordion <laughs> You know, don't have an accordion in front of me, but I have to do the, the hand motion. I, I camp along on the accordion, and I play also, uh, I play a song uh, in a good part of the, the, the five-minute uh, cheering for the health care and essential workers. I play for their jolly good fellows, and most people know that song, and no one has to sing along. It, 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 speaks, it speaks for itself. And very often, in the middle of our uh, celebration of the essential and healthcare workers, a uh, pizza delivery truck will come down the street, or a US Postal Service truck, or uh, even sometimes a sanitation uh, truck doing, doing a pickup. And when they come along, everybody cheers especially louder, and I play for their jolly good fellows. But as I was starting to say, I have decided shortly after I started this, if, couple of weeks after that I should link up the concerts once a week to the seven o'clock the seven o'clock celebration for the essential and health care workers so I've been starting the concerts about 615 or 630 and going 45 minutes or so or an hour from there with a break in the middle to do the the regular cheering on and thanking of the health care and, and other essential workers so how long do you think you'll keep this up um, well concerts from the stoop. that's a good question I haven't um, I haven't decided yet but one thing that sort of gave me extra energy and, and, and cheered me on um, but uh, for the foreseeable future I would say certainly as long as I have to be limited in, in, in going out because uh, of the pandemic and the, that there's no vaccine and no definitive treatment um, but one thing that, that, that's kept me going is that we've gotten a, tr a tremendous amount of press here. It's, it's absolutely unbelievable, all the press that um, has come to my stoop or come to me via Zoom. And there have been stories about what, what I, I, I gave them a name. I called them the emergency accordion stoop extravaganzas and Elena made a, a nice sign that said that to put out on the stoop and the Associated Press has incredible coverage all over the world literally they have hundreds and hundreds of outlets all over the world and it was picked up as a, a feel-good story for the Associated Press and it was in everything from from the New York Times to NBC News, ABC News, 1010 Winds, um, small town papers and, and smaller market radio stations all over the country, in England, in Australia, in I think it was United Arab, Arab Emirates, uh, um, all over the world people picked up the story and, and some were print media some were uh, web media and they put this video which you just saw on the uh, on on the, the computer and many used it in their broadcast channels wherever they are and I've gotten reactions from friends in other parts of the country and um, be, before the Associated Press a very fine independent uh, videographer uh, Aaliyah Scootercast, she put it out and she has very strong connections with, with mass, mass media and it and got a number of, of stations because of her. And then my, my old union, which I'm retired from, the Public New York State Public Employees Federation wrote an article in their newspaper, a local, um, a local Brooklyn newspaper called the Brooklyn Reporter did a story about it. Liberty Bellows, which many of you know is one of the best uh, courting stores in the country, featured me in their newsletter, um, which goes out to a very large audience. And last but certainly not least, Stephanie Simon, the arts and culture reporter of uh, all news uh, station, TV, web, I should say, uh, New York One. Uh, they they did a, uh, included me in a story about about musicians doing music and lifting the spirits of their neighbors and bringing them together. So uh, 
as I like to say, that in a dollar thirty-five will get me on the subway, and I'm not even taking the subway these days. But it just felt good. It was, it was a sort of uh, that, that I could that I did this from home. For, I was thought for a small number of people. I put it on Facebook, and now it's been all over the world, literally, and with a very positive response all over the country and all over the world. So, um, in closing, would you suggest that all your fellow musicians out there try? Try something like this from wherever they are? I definitely would. And in fact, um, wonderful uh, music producer, culture producer, Ariana Hellerman put up on her Facebook page, and she has a very wide readership, what I had done, encouraged other recording players to do it, and definitely some have, and various other uh, musicians have, have, have taken it up. And I would like to think that the fact that I did it had some influence on, on other people, though I can't say exactly how much, because uh, I love being a musician. I love playing the accordion, and I love lifting people's spirits and bringing them together through my music. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Now it's time, time for the hot seat. And uh, today we have Sari Kalin. Uh, she will perform for us, and we will we will make comments, uh, constructive criticisms, and uh, she will play "Come Sunday" by Duke Ellington uh, from the Sacred Concerts. Here is Sari Kalin.
Thank you, thank you, Sari. We have this is we have a this is really wonderful from Nathan Kachi. And any more? Well, you a wonderful. That's wonderful to get. Uh, any more comments? Excellent from Jack. Great arrangement. Beautiful performance. My cat liked it too. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Three, uh, three thumbs up. Really tasteful phrasing. Okay. Um, I enjoyed the mood you created. Uh, peaceful. Nice dynamics. Nice sensitivity and attention to phrases. And thank you all. I like the register changes from John DePinto. Yes, good point. And uh, uh, sorry, it sounds like you're uh, batting a thousand here. Uh, and so wow. uh, all, 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 all good comments. Yeah, I'll make a few observations. Um, uh, Duke Ellington in 1962 was approached by the pastor of what was to be a new cathedral in San Francisco called Grace Cathedral. And he was asked to write music for a sacred concert. And he, did, he as Ellington said, he did not want to write a mass. Uh, so he wrote his own collection of songs and made a service out of it. And one of the critics said uh, he actually took the Cotton Club review into the church. And uh, so you have an example of a composer who was deeply religious and he was able to unite, in a sense, body, mind, and spirit in his music. And you hear it, of course, in this particular piece and, and even in his, in his quote, unquote, secular compositions. And uh, the thing about Come Sunday, and which you may even want to do a little more with, is the melody has a perfect arch. And uh, in other words, ya, da, da, ya, the first arch, ya, da, 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 ya. And then leading up to ya, da, and the descent, da, 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 da. It's, it's the perfect combination of blues and, uh, and liturgical, uh, and, you know, and, and, and liturgical elegance. And so if you can combine those two elements even a little more, uh, it, would be, uh, it, it would be fantastic. And yes, practice by singing it, Sari. Absolutely, practice by singing it. And the middle part, the second time you do the middle part, could you swing it a little bit? Boom, 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 boom. Well, not the first time, but the second part. Then the last thing I'm going to say is in the, in the, uh, in the sacred concert, uh, it, uh, the same melody is used in the next piece, and it's faster. And it's called, you know, David Dance Before the Lord with All His Might. And uh, that is danced by a tap dancer. And so you almost see the Cotton Club review being done religiously. It's incredible. And it's the same tune. He danced before the Lord with all his might. Ear. And uh, see if there's anything you can get from that. Uh, maybe just a, an, 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 inner, an inner vibe. Uh, but really, uh, wonderfully done, wonderful comments, and... Uh, Thank you very, very, very much, Sari, uh, for sharing that with us. And best of luck in everything else that you do. And Sari's been with us for quite some, you know, quite a few years already. And we enjoy, we enjoy having her. And uh, she, she gets better every year. And so, uh, again, thank you. Thank you, Sari. Now, thank you, Bill. Uh, you're quite welcome. Uh, now, uh, when you... Uh, when you go out to dinner, uh, or, you know, yeah, when you go out to dinner, what, no matter where it is, uh, whether it's, uh, uh, 
whether it's a four star restaurant or whether it's uh, Burger King, uh, wherever you go, uh, do you have a tendency to savor uh, or, or do you go, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and, and gobble it and gobble it down. Well, here's the situation. When you do music and when you play a piece or when you organize a program, do you have a tendency to, to savor or you have a tendency to go, um, 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 even a performance. Do you savor that performance or do you go, um, 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 or do you take, you know, do you take great care to find out where you can, um, 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 or where you really should be savoring? And so um, I asked uh, Denise if she would prepare a concert or a talk, uh, which she subtitled Accordion Appetites. And then she ended up calling up Jean Valonis on the phone and they had this conversation. Jean was from her kitchen and they decided on giving us a little talk called Accordion Appetites. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, Accordion Appetites, Denine, uh, Denise Conchelic and Jean Valonis. today um i'm at home in dobbs ferry i have a question if you have um if you have a chance uh to, i'm thinking ahead a little bit to concert time when that starts up again and uh started to try to make some program plans and i'm really kind of stuck and i was wondering if you had any um like guidelines or tips like when you program a recital for yourself or for a group with your sort of like how do you approach it just overall Right. You know, I, I take it in, into consideration a lot of different things when I'm doing a program, but uh, first and foremost, I want to think about my audience. Mm -hmm. who, who is the program for? When we're talking about know your audience, uh, your audience is, are they the people that go to the hamburger joint? <laughs> <laughs> Hamburgers, hot dogs, a fish option, and maybe a veggie burger? Uh, or is it the audience that goes to the French restaurant with the um, pretentious items or the things that they want to try? One of the things I like to do is kind of make an arc and think about the entire program. And uh, since we're both in our kitchens, Maybe we could talk about it sort of like a meal, making a meal. Well, you, you'd have an appetizer, like your opening number, right? <laughs> yeah. And then um, you might have cocktails, too. Uh, of course, you'd have a main dish or an entree, uh, maybe a palate cleanser, uh, dessert. We have to have dessert, right? And yeah. maybe even an after dinner um, coffee or after dinner drink, something like that. So, would that be encore maybe? A what? Would, would that be like your, your little coffee or your little like thing? Would that be like, yeah. like an encore? So, like an appetizer, how are you going to introduce your program? You want to come out guns blazing. You want to come out just ease into the program. Um, you know what's the what's the timbre? What's the texture? What's the what's the mood that you want to open up with? For a, a musical selection, you could maybe have uh, if you were doing a classical style concert something from the Baroque period, uh, mm -hmm. not terribly complex, that's not terribly long, just something to ease into the program. Um, mm -hmm. 
or you could come out gangbusters. <laughs> da, 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 big peas, big start. <laughs> <laughs> But it should really sort of set the tone, like um, be the uh, the sense of what the rest of the concert is going to be about. I think so. I like to do themes. Mm -hmm. So if you, you're doing a classical concert, you might be doing it chronologically, or uh, composers from the Russian Five. Mm -hmm. With the uh, Main Squeeze Orchestra, one of the programs we did was movie themes. And oh. uh, like James Bond and Peter Gunn and newer music from uh, Requiem for a Dream, uh, songs that were associated with motion pictures. Mm -hmm. And I guess too, when you have a, a situation where you know there's going to be an intermission or not, then do you program differently with regard to the first and the second half, or just like if it's a whole run through kind of a, of a thing, like if it's a, something like that? Right. Oh, yeah. I think definitely if you have an intermission, for, for the performers, you want to think about your endurance. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how much do you, energy do you need for that second half of the program? How much do you need for the first half? Are you doing mm -hmm. building up to the intermission and then easing back into it? Are you building mm -hmm. to the end of the program? A lot of times I will do the first half just a hair longer so that you get a, the bulk of your work and the bulk of your um, music into that first half. And then the second half, um, more novelty pieces maybe, or um, you want to, of course, save, save up for your dessert. How <laughs> 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 oh, you're going to end the program. Right. You want to have different um, tempi, you know, some fast pieces, some slow pieces. Of course, different dynamics that you're going to show the range of your group, your instrument, your music. Mm -hmm. some, some things soft, some things bigger. Um, I always think about what's the time signature. Like, I'm not going to do three waltzes in a row. I'm not going to oh. do three polkas in a row, three marches in a row. Um, I also, one thing that I do is uh, I look at the key signature as well. So... You have three pieces in E flat major. All right, maybe one's in three, four, one's in two, four, one's in four, four. Okay, but they're still all in the same key. So I want to make sure that I'm changing up not only the time signature, but the key signature, the texture of the piece. Mm -hmm. Especially on accordion, we've got if you're playing everything on the main register, even if you get soft and loud, even if it's a different key, even if it's a different meter, it still has the same sort of sound to it, the timbre. Right. right. Um, changing registrations, changing the mood of the music, changing the style of the music. I like to um, break it up. You might have short sections where it's like three pieces that are similar if you're doing them as a group. Mm -hmm. But think about your overall arc again. You don't want to do everything all the same. Like you said, the texture. So I guess you can think about our registrations as like the musical spice rack of our dinner plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little hot pepper. <laughs> <laughs> Make it buttery, like butter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, or is it crunchy? Or is it mushy? Or does it have a smooth sauce on it? Mm. Uh -huh. Oh, the sauce. Don't forget the sauce. <laughs> Hot, cold. Yeah. So if, if you're putting together a meal, a lot of times we'll think about how things lead to the next one. You know, are you going to have something 
a little bit spicy and then more spicy and then super spicy. So yeah, you, you want to have different flavors, different textures. Yeah. Tango. Tango would be like uh, Diablo sauce. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> the Bach. Bach might be just the pasta. <laughs> or maybe the bread. Maybe, maybe Bach would be the bread. Mozart could be ravioli. I wonder, you know, you know when you go out to a restaurant and you're ordering and a waiter comes over and they, you know, they take the towel and they put it over their arm and they say, you know, well, I was, uh, our specials today are, uh, um, they, um, they tell you about the specials and they tell you a little bit about, about the process. And I don't know, that maybe makes, makes you more likely to order just because you know more about it and it's more exciting. You might not have been going to be ordering what they, ask, what they uh, bring out to tell you about, but now all of a sudden you're intrigued. If you tell the audience um, what you're going to do, some of these mm -hmm. 20th century pieces, you might have different techniques and it doesn't have a melody and it's all about um, sound. But if you tell them, mm -hmm. the piece starts out like you're walking through the woods and then a tree falls in front of you and then a bunch of little animals run around and you come out to an open pond, then the audience has a, not a preconceived notion, but they have an idea of what's coming up. But also talking about programming, I think it's good to have something on each program that the majority of your audience is familiar with. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Just something, if, if they've got nothing else from the program, like I say, Oh yeah, and they played this piece that I knew since I was a little kid, and they put a different spin on it maybe, but something that's familiar, so that everyone has something they can take away from the program. Well, um, at the risk of making a horrible pun, this is for me for thought. Um, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I feel like I've got something to go on now, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I urge you all to feast on that. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, drink it all in and, uh, and use it, of course, when you uh, are planning your, planning your concert. We'll now hear from Bactopus, and this is a, an accordion quartet that was organized to play Bach. It ended up, of course, playing other, other composers as well. It was founded by Robert Duncan, along with uh, Mayumi Mioka, uh, Peter Flint, and Jean Valonis. Uh, they have an incredible title, Bachtopus, I love their title. And uh, there was a, a week of Baroque music here in New York. Uh, all the top Baroque groups were playing around the city. And on the classical music station here, they announced a week of Bach and, uh, uh, and they said, we're gonna have the greatest Baroque music groups in the city all play here. And they said, including a, an accordion quartet called Bactopus. Uh, so word to the wise, uh, when you start a group, get a good title and, and play as well as your title and, maybe, and better. <laughs> Here is Bactopus performing Immortal Bach by Newt Nizecht. <laughs>
beautiful piece. As a matter of fact, uh, it, it, it's originally a vocal piece. And it was arranged for accordions by Robert Duncan. And um, the original piece uh, was uh, written for voices to be placed far apart. And uh, although I think it really, really, really uh, lays very, very well with the, uh, with the accordion, in a sense, they become voices. And uh, the instructions for this piece are uh, to take this particular Bach chorale and do it once and then sustain certain, certain notes that he gives. Uh, and what happens is the piece starts to melt. It starts to melt into the ethers, into the stratosphere, and you know, it starts to time travel a bit. And I shouldn't even say a bit, it really does. It goes off into another realm, uh, another dimension, another sphere. And so uh, that was immortal Bach, and of course Bach is immortal, and uh, beautifully, beautifully done, and a beautiful piece. And we'll now hear, and we'll close up with Catalonia, and Catalonia is a, uh, a musical piece that I had written. And uh, Denise Kincellic, uh did some visuals. They did a visual collage to go along with it. And uh, my piece was Catalonian in style. And it was written in response to a lot of the rough stuff that was going on in the 70s with, uh, with dictatorship. And uh, she, uh, Denise, uh, paralleled it with what's going on today. And I kind of felt that the, uh, that the histories, the parallel histories worked very, very well together. And so the, we call the piece Catalonia, even though the visuals will look like some, you know, the events that are going on today. So let's see and hear Catalonia.
That was Catalonia, music by yours truly, and the visual collage, Denise Concelli. I'd like to thank you all for, be, uh, for being at this workshop. And I also would, would like to thank my uh, producer, Rashid Elad Looney, and my artistic director, Mickey Goodman Schimmel, my wife. And uh, we are going to take a short break and uh, we will resume at 4.05, I'm sorry, yeah, 4.05. And so we'll start at 4.05. Apparently you can talk amongst yourselves and uh, I'll see you at 4.05. Uh, not yet. Good late afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. And uh, those of you who are just tuning in right now, I'm uh, Dr. William Schimmel, and uh, I won't go through the space cowboy routine anymore today. Uh, I think we, we, uh, we did that already. And uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, start the show. And, uh, our first piece will be a work that I had composed for the main squeeze accordion orchestra, which is an all girl orchestra. And you will actually see them on a video tomorrow. Uh, but today you will hear the piece. And uh, visuals will be by Denise Konchelik. The piece is called Cyclops Girl. And uh, you'll understand what I mean when you see the visuals. And I'll say something about it afterwards. So ladies and gentlemen, Cyclops Girl. One, two, three, four. <laughs>
time is right. Cyclops Girl, um, music by yours truly uh, for the Main Squeeze Orchestra and for you. And the, uh, the visual of collage was Denise Kinchelik. Um, this idea came to me uh, about a year ago uh, in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, interesting. Uh, I was working with the, uh, with the orchestra. I, I do the Minnesota Orchestra. Uh, and... Um, I was in my, health, my hotel room in, in the afternoon, and for whatever reason, I, the, melody, uh, the melody came to me, and including the simple words, Cyclops Girl. And I said to myself, uh, you, know, what, you know, what does that mean, Cyclops Girl? So I wrote it out, and I wrote parts out for the Main Squeeze Orchestra, and, uh, and I imagined, you know, and I suppose when we do it again, uh, we imagined that they would wear uh, something in the middle of their forehead uh, that was a kind of a, a third eye. And uh, to give it also to give an Eastern Indian look as well, because the music has that, what we call, what, what is actually called semi-classical music in India. So if Indian pop is called semi-classical. Here, some of my classical music is uh, the Ray Kant of singers or uh, uh, the stuff to, that we used to listen to back in the 1950s that was kind of mood music. That was always called semi-classical music. But in, in India, uh, Indian pop or Bollywood that is actually called semi-classical music. And so that's what this is sort of a takeoff uh, on. I later found out that uh, that there was a Japanese cartoon series called a series called Cyclops Girl, and I looked it up, and there it was. And uh, then, of course, you see the images images here. Uh, there is, in some dimension or other, in some time travel dimension, there is a Cyclops Girl. And uh, so, look around. There might be. They might be closer than you than you think. Uh, now I'm going to introduce a guy who has a wonderful trio, and he hangs out somewhere in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. Now I don't know if you ever heard of Jim Thorpe. It's uh, it's somewhere in Pennsylvania, and it's called Jim Thorpe, and uh, and there's mountains there, and and it's quite rural. But I understand it's become quite uh, international and quite sophisticated. And uh, Doug Makafka has a trio. 
And uh, it's a combination of uh, heavy metal meets religious, meets uh, gospel, meets uh, Norwegian death metal. Uh, he kind of puts it all together. And I'd like you to hear the Dove Makafka trio right now. You'll see the credits at the very, very, very end. There's a few of them. And, uh, but I want to introduce this trio right now, ladies and gentlemen, the Duck Makafka Trio. Benedictus, the Doug Makafka trio. And uh, only through the accordion you're going to, you're going to get uh, Norwegian death metal, gospel, heavy, heavy metal, the Grateful Dead, uh, Motorhead, you know, Lemmy, uh, all in a wonderful mix that becomes quite original. And thank the accordion for that. And of course, thank Doug for putting it all together. And uh, I see a yes agreed from Sari. So she agrees with me on all these, and all these elements that go into this wonderful, uh, this wonderful soup. And, uh, and, and all this took place in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. And uh, so uh, makes me want to visit. And uh, so <laughs> now, Jean Valonis, we're going to call her back. And uh, she sent out a Christmas card last year. And she sent it out in a kind of a Western style. 
and uh, it was like wanted, one of those wanted dead or alive kind of things. Uh, and wanted for this, wanted for that, wanted for this and so forth. And it was a really, really funny card. And uh, I had, uh, so I decided I would uh, write musical interludes to, uh, you know, to what was on the cards. And I called the composition, this collaboration, Wanted. And uh, Jean will now perform it for you as a performance piece. And so ladies and gentlemen, Jean Valonis, her text, my music. Wanted for marauding and pillaging. Wanton Canoeing. For disturbing the peace. For willful hirsuteness, excessive height, and being silly without a license. <laughs>
by order of U.S. Marshal Kokomo. Thank you, Gene. Uh, that was uh, quite a performance, and uh, we need more of that. Uh, yesterday, we had a wonderful talk on new works for the accordion, works that you know are published, written, and you can go home and learn them and play them in concerts and so forth. And there's also parallel dimensions one can do new things in. And obviously with the, the visual medium and so forth, and uh, you can make new works that are you know, performance works, video works, performance works. Years ago, uh, they called it performance art. And right now it's kind of an outdated term and I would prefer performance. And um, with, the, with these dimensions in terms of uh, you know, vi you know, video, uh, uh, even social media, uh, along with the accordion doing particular kinds of performance, we can get new works there too. And uh, so I think we need a parallel of both where we can create new compositions that, you know, one can go on social media and look at, one can go on, uh, uh, on YouTube and see the performances. Uh, my wife, Mickey Goodman, and myself, we have uh, a numerous amounts of videos that we made together on YouTube. We urge you to go look at them. And they're total compositions, total collaborations, and, uh, and visual movement, and uh, of course, uh, video art. And uh, that's uh, a good deal of our creative life together. Uh, and we, we do one or two of them a year. And, uh, and we feel that that's a, a dimension that uh, can be explored, of course, in the arts, and it certainly is a good is a good dimension for the the accordion, along with new works that you know that are published and you you know open them open them and learn them and play them. I think they can go side by side, and maybe in the end, one of those works can be become a vi a, a visual work as well. So uh, the possibilities are 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 pretty endless there. Um, so. Uh, the seminars uh, are, are, were never, never meant to be uh, student recitals. Uh, everyone is a creative artist in themselves, uh, exploring new and interesting ways and new angles on the accordion. But many of them have been through a program. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. I, uh, my accordion teacher, instructor, mentor was Dr. Jacob C. Newpower. And I went to the Newpower Conservatory uh, in Philadelphia and I graduated. This was by four, four of my Juilliard years. And uh, I decided that I would bring the conservatory training to New York on a one-to-one -one basis. So I put many of my uh, students th through the paces of you would get at a conservatory. And this program became the Order of the Shield program taught here in New York. And uh, many, of, many of the people involved in the seminars have gone, have been put through those paces and have gone through that particular kind of program. Um, we've had uh, David Stoller, who you will now hear coming up. We'll have uh, Will Holtzhauser, Denise, Doug McKafka, Paul Stein, 
Benjamin Ickes, Godfrey Nelson, Lorraine Nelson Wolf. They've all been uh, they've all been through the paces in this particular program, and they've taken it into the professional world. They've taken it into the artistic world, and uh, and they've uh, they've made a great contribution uh, to the uh, to the contemporary to the contemporary arts. And uh, a gentleman uh, I'm going to introduce to you now, David Stoller, is one of those people. And he was a graduate of the Order of the Shield, the conservatory. And uh, what he did was he created today a time travel piece. But uh, when I approached him about writing a time travel piece, he said to me, I did that tri time travel thing years ago. And of course, it turns out for his graduation of the Order of the Shield many, many years ago, he did a time travel piece, but it was an electronic piece and it was before he decided to take up the accordion. And uh, so he now did a new one where he plays accordion and he composed it and he joined together with this wonderful mandolin player, Hop Kuffner, and it's for accordion, electronic tape, and mandolin. And the movements are, is called Tempo, Vo I'm sorry, Tempo Voyager Time Travel. And the movements are Chant Time, Steam Time, Jazz Time, Off Time, Funk Time, Prime Time, and Re Time. So uh, welcome to some more time travel through David Stoller. Ladies and gentlemen.
it's a matter of time. Ah, thank you, David. And that wonderful mandolinist was Hap Kuffner. Uh, wonderful piece. And uh, you took me there, David. You took me there. And uh, now we're going to uh, uh, see and hear uh, two other uh, Order of the Shield uh, graduates. And uh, Godfrey Nelson, Lorraine Nelson Wolf. And I had asked them uh, if we could do a work based on Schubert's uh, Gretchen's spinning, spinning wheel, Gretchen's spinning wheel. And uh, they got this idea that they would record something in their studio in Hudson, New York, and that I would send my part in uh, by uh, cell phone and where I would actually tape myself visually as well as sound and, and somehow get it to them. Uh, and uh, then they visually put me into the video and then brought in a soprano, wonderful one, Alexandra Hoffman. And uh, for a new version of Gretchen's Spinning Wheel by, of course, Franz Schubert. And uh, to say a little bit about Godfrey and Lorraine, uh, Lorraine does a, now does a lot of liturgical music. She actually has her own school up, you know, upstate New York. Godfrey has made hit records for Belafonte uh, and numerous others. And uh, uh, they're a, a wonderful duo. And it's, uh, I enjoy every year going up to Hudson, New York to play at the Helsinki Club with them. And uh, which is a wonderful, which is a wonderful club. But let's listen now to uh, Gretchen's Spinning Wheel, their version of it. And uh, let's go.
Gretchen's Spinning Wheel, A Realization by Godfrey Nelson and Lorraine Nelson Wolf, including the visuals, uh, soprano Alexandra Hoffman, and uh, yours truly in, in the mix. Uh, now, I'd like to introduce Cornmo, one of the, in my mind, one of the greatest indie rock singers around. And he also happens to be classically trained. And we actually did the entire Schubert Winter Ice uh, song cycle. Uh, you can get it on Bandcamp. Uh, and he sang it legitimately, like legit. Uh, but I'd like, to, like you to hear one of his, one of his songs. And I, I consider it a leader uh, and, and it's in its own way. It's a beautifully written song called Superman. And this is Cornmo in Superman. Get up. I know you're trying to sleep. Get up. There's something I want you to see. It's no big deal. It's just that Superman's on the TV. The casting is spot on. Here's a Lego minifig if you want to follow along. Later you can use them for your rewrites and sequels. It's rekindled my concern with the San Andreas Fault. Falling through the cracks, what is enough getting swallowed by the earth get up i know you're trying to sleep get up there's something i want you to see it's no big deal it's just the superman's on the tv to kindle my concern with the san andreas fault let me stop the world from spinning Us. Get up, I know you're trying to sleep, get up, there's something you need to know, I'm around, I'm around, get up, I'm glad you're here, get up, I'm glad you're still around, if you need anything, just ask.
Superman by Corn Mo. It's a beautiful piece, beautiful. And uh, we will close the program with two videos by Paul Stein. And so uh, let's watch and hear them. Called by Paul Stein. Eric Garner stood proud at six foot A warm teddy bear of a man was he. Lived in Staten Island with his family. Lost his life to police brutality. Check out the video, it's plain to see. He was choked to death. By the NYPD, another black man down in a murder like cop. We're here to declare that this killing must stop. Cops claim he stole Lucy's on the street, so they went to arrest him on their beat. For selling cigarettes, they took his life, left behind six children and a wife. Check out the video, it's plain to see. He was choked to death by the NYPD. Another black man cut down in a murder like club. We're here to declare that this killing must stop. Eric cried, I can't breathe, as the cops jumped his back. Did they ignore him cause his skin is black? Eleven times I can't breathe as he ran out of air. But the cops kept on pressing, they just didn't care. Check out the video, it's plain to see. He was choked to death by the NYPD. Another black man cut down in a murder by cop. We're here to declare that the killing must stop. As Eric lay motionless in great distress, teased in rush to treat our assess. Along with the cops, they just stood around as Eric was unconscious on the ground. Check out the video, it's plain to see. He was choked to death by the NYPD. Another black man cut down in a murder by cop. We're here to declare that this killing must stop. The medical examiner confirmed how he died. The Emmys reports homicide. Justice demands that the cops do hard time for murdering Eric, a racist crime. Check out the video. It's plain to see. He was choked to death. By the NYPD, another black man cut down in a murder by cop. We're here to declare that the stealing must stop. There was Amadou, Patrick, Ramali before, Tamir, Sandra, and so many more. Now Brianna, George, Richard, the list just grows. No justice, no peace. That's how it goes. Check out the video, it's plain to see. He was choked to death by the NYPD. Another black man cut down in a murder by cop. We're here to declare that this killing must Welcome everybody to the fourth emergency accordion stoop. Extravaganza. When Corona is gone away, when Corona has gone away, oh Lord, I want to see in that number. I saw press reports of people in France and Italy, I believe, hanging out of their windows, going out to their balconies, and singing together. They have 
windows and balconies in France and Italy, we have stoops. We are able to be physically apart while being very much together. It's such a neat thing to be going on. I love it. It just brings a lot of life to the neighborhood in kind of a really weird, oppressive time. It's one more way of making New York City feel like a small town. But if I didn't have this music to play, I would be just sitting around, you know, so depressed and, and feeling terrible that I hadn't made any contribution at all. I'm 71 years old, and all my life I've been an activist, and it's very frustrating for me to sort of be confined to my house. I can change the mood in this block a little. Music lifts people's spirits and it brings them together. With all the horrible things going on and all the, the sadness, it's so important to bring some joy into people's lives. On that note, see you tomorrow. Thank you so much for coming today. And as in the words of Paul Stein, see you tomorrow. And uh, I'm on hand if you want to chat with me for a few minutes. And uh, hope you had a great time. Okay. You and me. Okay, I have a question. Now, in, sometimes in my church, when my music director uses transposition a lot, in other words, you would decide to take a song down maybe one step.